Hey everyone, Chris Haddon with Hard Money Bankers here with a really, really cool interview for our friends at Inman.com. Today, my guest is Mark Butterfield from Remax Realty Services. Mark, thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. You know, I've wanted to do this interview for a little while now, as I mentioned to you last week when we were scheduling, because there's so much stuff out there for agents. There's so much stuff out there for investors, but broker, owner, focus content is kind of rare, even on Inman which is obviously the, the source for a lot of real estate news. So I appreciate you taking the time and contributing your knowledge and years of experience. I'm looking forward to this. Sure, I'm happy to help. All right, let's back up and start at the beginning. If you wouldn't mind, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into business and real estate specifically? Yeah, sure. So I, um, I got my real estate license actually while I was in college and because I'd always sort of been interested in my family background. Uh, my parents had been involved in real estate and so on. And so it was always, you know, like I said, I had the interest in it. So uh, then in uh, just about two years after I got out of school, um, I met this woman who my father introduced me to who was managing a brokerage. And she sort of said, you know, if you come work for me, I'll take you under my wing and I'll show you how to do it. And uh, I sold 18 houses my first year hmm. and just kept going from there. Um, shortly after I got into it, I realized, I, I though, that I wanted to own a brokerage. I didn't want to just be an agent forever. So I uh, ended up moving into the REMAX uh, family in, um, oh gosh, about 1990. And then by 92, I bought my first franchise. Um, it was a really, it's still a very dynamic and growing company. Mm -hmm. and over 100 countries, there's about 120,000 agents now. And it was just a really good, the, the decision at that point was whether to start my own, being a boutique broker or right. go with a franchise. There are, of course, with a franchise, you've got franchise fees. But there are so many benefits. I don't think I, I now have about 100 agents. We do 500 in the last year, about 565 million in sales. I don't think I ever would have grown that large as a boutique broker. Um, okay. The advantages of the franchise network have been really good. They've definitely helped me grow. Let me jump in with a question or two, because some of this stuff, stuff is uh, definitely interesting on a business level. So what was going on in your first, what was going on in your mind in your first year or two or three that said, I want to be a broker owner, agent's good, but it's not the end. Like what, walk me through the thought process there. So I was always enamored with actually how the company was run. And um, I it just it, selling 18 houses by, this is before computers, by the way. Sure. It's all running. And it's all right, all right. over uh, with each transaction. And I liked, okay, is I was there and the company was growing. And it's like, okay, wait, I can, she's, uh, it was a female, uh, my broker owner. And she's making money when they're out working. And it was more um, leveraged is what it was. Kind of the way oh, right. listings is being leveraged. If you don't have any listings sure. with a buyer, you got to shut one shot at it, you know? So it's, it's leveraged. So hundred people, if I lose one or two, you know, it doesn't kill you. And it's right. a business that works when you're not there. If you've done it right. Le leverage stuff. So very, you know, running a loan portfolio. We, we know a lot about that. So leveraging things that you can put in place that bring in dollars is obviously a big, a big part of the goal. So in addition to that, uh, talk a little bit about the skill sets required at the beginning. Let's, let's talk about the early days, the skill sets required. You jump in, you're a broker owner now bought a franchise. Talk about some of the challenges, the new things that you had to face that you just, you know, didn't anticipate or weren't a hundred percent prepared for. So it's, a, you know, real estate's a very much of a relationship based business. And the, and early on you think, okay, well, I'm going to hire somebody to answer the phones and then I'll hire somebody to help me with the accounting and that kind of thing. But those have to be the right people. Mm -hmm. And it's a skill set that just comes with time, learning how to manage people. It's a really big deal. Uh, it, it is something that comes sort of naturally to me. I think I have, Oh, my staff, I've had one with me for 15 years, another one for seven years. And I did have a lady who stayed with me for a little over 20 years uh, before she finally left. So um, those things have been really, they, they provide sort of a solid foundation. But you've got to work with people. You can't micromanage them. You've got to give them room to grow. And you've got to delegate responsibility, but then keep them accountable. Yeah. You know, I think, I think that's a common thing amongst new business owners is that, they 
in some ways knew that they were going to be managing people and personalities and individuals, but there's no way to, until you're in it, you don't know how that's going to go. You don't know what the challenges are going to be. You, you probably make the mistake of assuming that everyone in the world's like you. And then you pretty quickly realize that that is not the case at all. <laughs> right. Well, the other thing I found is that everybody that works for me has got to be able to do something better than I can. Because if I'm better at it than everybody else, they can't really help me. So my bookkeeper has got to be really good at bookkeeping. She is really good at it. Right. My, my admin staff are good at marketing and things like social media and that kind of stuff. So some, they all, somebody's got to have a skill. It, it doesn't mean they all have to have uh, educations from some great university or anything like that. They have to be people sure. you know, oriented and um, they've got to have a skill, like I said. Yeah. So building your team around you with complementary skill sets. Right. Okay. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. All right. Let's talk about the growth years because that was back then. And I know that now you're at, do you have three offices? Is that right? Yes. Correct. Let's talk about the growth years in terms of revenue, people, locations, all of that. Okay. So what I, the other thing, obviously I started with one Your the first thing that comes into place is your location. Okay. Mm -hmm. In order, in order to attract people, what I found is I knew we had we got to be in the right spot, uh, meaning leasing the office in the right place. It's great if you can buy one, but it um, and everything in it has got to be uh, up to speed, first class, nothing broken. I can't stand mm -hmm. equipment or old equipment. We change things like our copier every three years automatically. Um, I don't try and work with the old one, but so so when people come in, you're making this impression. And uh, it was a favorable one, and that's what led to the growth. Um, it was marketing to, uh, uh, you know, the, the real estate community, a lot of phone calls to recruit, um, having my agents be involved in that, making it nice enough so that they wanted their friends to be there too, that kind of thing. And it just led to some uh, pretty strong growth. It's, it's something, recruiting, you're never done with a brokerage. Right. Uh, it's always, you lose some people. The attrition. Some people get out of the business. Some people move away. That kind of thing. So that's that's a job that's never finished. For sure. Um, let's talk about the physical space for a second because I've noticed that about your Bethesda location is that I went in there. It was for a holiday party. It wasn't that long ago, maybe a year or so, and it didn't look outdated before. Yet it was renovated. It was, it looked new and improved. And so you you really do stay on top of that, and that makes a lot of sense. Like people. Yeah, I'm sure you've been in some of the old, tired kind of real estate offices over the years where like nothing seems to change. And it's like not the kind of place you would want to brag about, invite friends, show off to clients. But you do put effort into that. Exactly. If you talk to agents, I hear this all the time. No, I never go into the office because it's kind of a dump and I'd be embarrassed to bring people in there. And that doesn't work. It doesn't work personally and it doesn't work professionally, I think. So my staff teases me about it because I generally paint the offices like every three years. It's got to be kept up fresh and it's, we update things all the time. And what, what you're doing is you're showing, I'm showing my agents that I'm investing in my business. So they can see constantly that, I mean, we're changing plants and pictures and stuff like that all the time. That thing that's been there for 20 years, get rid of it. Because they, they, by um, them seeing, we're setting an example. Them seeing me invest in my business makes them realize they need to keep investing in their businesses. Mm, that's a good point. Lead by example. I like that. And in addition to investing in your business by doing the things that you just mentioned, you're also investing in the culture, in the work culture of your company. Yes. Talk about that a little bit if you wouldn't mind. So it really matters to, especially to the younger crew at this point, I'm going to turn 60 this year. I've been doing it a long time. Uh, I've been a broker owner for 27 years. Um, the people that I want are like almost my kid's age. I want people in their 30s, maybe early 40s. It's not the people, I hate to say it, that are winding down at the end of their career. You can certainly get some top producers there. Sure. But, uh, I'm trying to build something that will ultimately be saleable. And um, I, so these people, I have a whole lot of people that have been with me for more than 20 years. And it is the culture of, uh, of the constant change, the updating and making everybody feel that we're up to date makes them want to stay because they are being recruited by other brokerages. Oh yeah. Coming in, throwing a lot of money into these things. So it's important. It's got to look good. On that note, if you could also touch a little bit about on the other people in your recruiting efforts and hiring staff about 
people's, even if they're top producers or whoever they may be, in their effect on the culture that you're trying to build. Okay, so uh, let me go back to the other point because there's something I don't want to forget. Back to the sure. I, uh, a bunch of years ago, I did have the opportunity to buy a commercial building in uh, the Silver Spring area, just you know, about five miles from one of my existing offices. And I did a gut renovation. It was a, it was a, it built, been built originally as a house uh, that was now commercial. It was a great investment. I did a gut renovation and it was really nice. And everybody's like, oh, it's so cute. I couldn't get top producers to come to it. They weren't interested in working in that kind of environment. It was just too small, too cozy. So, the that, okay. yeah. and, and uh, I, you know, it turned out it worked financially for me. I made money off the thing. But um, being in a nice office building with amenities uh, and good signage, it goes back again to what I was saying, the good location. It's just hugely, hugely important. Um, yeah. But now let's go back to your question, though, the recruiting of the, the higher producing agents. And, and how they fit in with the, the culture and everything else that you're trying to build in your company. So it, I had a chance about 18 months ago, I merged with another broker. I brought him on, actually bought him out. And he runs a very uh, high producing successful team. They do about 140 transactions a year. Um, at first, it was, uh, you know, first couple of months, it was people kind of, you know, button into each other. But as time has gone on, he has served as a role model and mm -hmm. has actually spoke at my last meeting uh, because it's like, okay, he's there. He's very, very friendly. His team is, we've, we've all grown together, um, but it made an impact. But now it's been a very positive impact uh, in the community. When I say, oh, he's with my office, they're like, oh, yeah, I know him. And other yes. broker owners are like, how did you get him? How did you do that? Because it was, uh, it, it, it's something that took us a couple of years, but um, the overall effect on the culture has been uh, really great, really great. That worked out well. I'm sure there are instances where you're going after the numbers, you're going after the producers and their volume and everything else, and maybe it's not the right fit for everyone else going on at the company. Have you come across that in the past? I have, uh, you know, early on, I had a lady in my career that did phenomenal business. So I'm talking about in like 1996, she had a seven figure income and, but she was chewing people up and spitting them out and <laughs> staff of like six people. And she was just brutally rough. And I would keep getting these calls from her customers, the same kinds of complaints over and over and over. And one of the things she was good at, is she made her customers afraid of her. Like, I don't want to say anything, but I don't ever want to deal with her again. Wow. Yeah. And it got so bad that finally I realized I couldn't, she was killing my name on the street. <laughs> she had this huge production. And at that time I had a partner and I was like, it's her or me because I can't run a business with the things that she's being, you know, over and over and over. And so it was a huge step back to kill to, I fired her. She was my biggest producer, but people wow. aren't in my company because of her. And she had a terrible reputation on the street. So uh, brokers have to be really aware of that. You get somebody that, that's messing your reputation up on the street and you're just going to kill yourself. Well, in addition, it's no way to live. Like who wants to come to work every day to, you know, I, I found over the years, my business partner, Jason, and I talked about this. If you find yourself talking every single day about a problem person or situation, usually a person, it's got to end. You can't just be coming in and talking about the same person and the same problem situation over and over and over. Because you know, something's got to give. Something's got to give. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, 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 and where's your integrity? Okay, I get it. We're making money off her, but my God, not at this. Right. Yeah, not setting a good example in a number of different ways. Totally agree with that. Um, okay, continuing with that kind of theme, the, the right people instead of the wrong people for your team. 